So the way I sort of set up my questions, I wanted to divide it between supplemental feeding and the depredation permits so that we can kind of keep things orderly. So if we could start with supplemental feeding, can you tell me um, what what is supplemental feeding and what are the rules around it? Sure. Um, do you want to take turns? I guess I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Let's have you actually say their name first so I know who to go to. Okay, well. okay, okay. All right, Stephanie, yeah. What What is supplemental feeding? Supplemental feeding is uh, an, an attempt to provide a diversionary supplement for bears. So when bears want to go into an area and they might be enticed to peel on a tree, they would go to this uh, feed that's provided so that they would not end up peeling on a tree and causing damage. What are the rules around what the feed can be? The feed is actually manufactured. It's, uh, it's not something we're involved in as an agency. It's uh, through the forest timber, commercial timber industry and they manufacture the feed and have it purchased through a commercial entity. Are there any rules about what you can and cannot put in it? We have some rules related to, um, not necessarily with feeding, but with baiting. We have rules that we restrict on the baiting. And um, we encourage people to use, um, you know, to just provide natural resources out there and not feed bears to encourage them into areas. Anise, do you want to add anything to what you're Yeah, so, so to add to that, the, the, <coughs> the reason they use supplementary feeding is the time of year when the peeling is happening, there's not uh, very much natural food out there for the bears. So basically, they're limited by the choices of food resources. So then that's why they're peeling trees and, and you know, trying to get nutrients that way. So they put supplemental feed out there to to divert them from e peeling the trees and eating them. Uh, as far as uh, feeding bears, uh, there are no rules around it. You can feed in those areas. I mean, there, we have rules around areas of uh, where people live and leaving trash out and things like that. But as far as feeding wildlife or feeding bears, there are really no rules what you can feed or anything like that. The only rules we have are related with hunting over bait, which which is a, a different thing than supplementary feeding. So as a follow-up to that, just speaking with George this morning, anywhere between, and I, this is another question I want to ask later, right now they're saying, hey, you know, we ordered 250,000 pounds of feed. Mm -hmm. Is it problematic that the state doesn't have any rules around what is in 250,000 pounds of feed? For the bears? It, not, not really. I mean, the bears are, are very good at, at figuring out what's edible and what's not. I mean, they've evolved through eons of, of testing foods and eating them. And so they're, if, it, if the food isn't going to be nutritious for them, they're not going to eat it. So it, it's not something that we would have to regulate based on, unless it's a poison and then we would see it. So, I mean, unless it's harming the bear, there really isn't a need to, for us to be uh, you know, trying to figure out what's in this feed and, 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 uh, and regulating I, it. Yeah, I would add also they did several studies on what they were going to put in, in the feed itself. And Anise brought up an excellent point that this is a seasonal component. And so when bears are um, out in, in during the spring when uh, trees are growing fast, and those fast growing trees, they have a high sugar content and that's what brings the bears into wanting to peel those trees. And as, as a diversionary uh, effect, they, they go for the feed rather than for the peel. It sounds like though, in Anise, what you were saying, that you're leaving the bears as their own managers when it comes to this feeding program and whether the food is good for them. Uh, yeah, and then they are the best at figuring out uh, whether the, the food is edible or not. I mean, that's that's what bears do. They're basically, you know, a, a stomach attached to a nose that figures out what's good to eat and what's not. Because from the moment they wake up uh, from hibernation till the moment they go back into hibernation, their main thing is to get enough fat reserves to, to make it through the next winter. So uh, there is really no better, I guess, animal out there that could figure out what's edible and what's not. So if I were to compare it to the elk feeding in Natchez, that's a state 
program where you buy the feed and you know what's in it and you even know how many elk are showing up and people could watch it. It's totally out in the open. Why doesn't the state manage this program? Why did the timber farms do it? So we don't, we don't do any kind of feeding of wildlife for, uh, uh, to basically keep animals from eating crops. The reason we feed animals is basically in certain areas is to basically get them through the winter in some instances or things like that. I'm talking about elk. But isn't that what this essentially is? This is getting them it's, through a period of time so yeah, they don't eat a crop? You're right, it is. But there are things on the landscape they could eat, including the trees. So this is a way to divert them from actually eating what's what the natural feed is. And uh, it would be a very costly program for the department to, to uh, administer, uh, given how much uh, timberland there is. And if the private industry is willing to take on that cost, it really uh, doesn't behoove us as a state agency to take that on because we're taking a cost on that really shouldn't be ours to take on. It's an industry that's growing trees for production and they've figured out a way to keep bears from stripping uh, their trees by supplemental feeding them. So it, it's an issue that's kind of uh, the industry has decided to take on and, and they're, they're bearing the cost. I don't think uh, a state agency should be uh, bearing that cost. It's a damage issue versus a, right. a population right. or a, a maintenance of a, a certain species on the landscape. Yeah. And, and as Anise alluded to, the, the industry themselves has have agreed and have worked through this process to minimize the damage on their, their product. And um, it, so in that case, it's very helpful for us that these industries are willing to take on that burden and with the elk issue, the example you brought up, that's a deficit, different scenario. That's managing a, an elk population and maintaining an elk population or resource on the landscape. That is our mandate. We are, you know, natural resource managers, and so we should be, um, or, so at least, or at least considering yeah, those options. Exactly. For, so an, uh, I guess th along with that, if we didn't feed the bears, they're not going to disappear. Yes, they're going to find exactly. something else to eat, and it's going to be usually trees or, or other things. So the, it, they You're saying the elk don't have that option? They don't. They don't. No, it's it's a, there would, I mean, there's the, just nothing else yeah, to eat. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and it's very limited when we feed animals. It's in very limited situations. And, and even the, the, the elk situation, uh, it's a very limited thing. We don't feed elk anywhere else but in that area. Uh, because of certain winter range limitations there. So, so it's not something that a state agency wants or likes to do because it's not a, it's not a, way to, it's not a, a valid way to manage wildlife by feeding them. Wildlife should be able to persist on their own. So why does it work in this case? In what case? In this case of the bears. This why case, is this valid? It's, not, it's, it's a valid way to divert them. It's not a valid way to manage the population. So it is a valid way to divert them from peeling trees. It's not a valid way mm -hmm. to supplement feed, feeding them to perpetuate the population. With or without feeding that population would be fine. Do so you it's a tool that's being used to divert them from eating the trees. Do you feel like the state has enough information uh, from WFPA about uh, where the barrels are, how much feed they're putting out there, what's in the feed. Are you content with the information you have about how the program is continuing? Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe we are. I mean, we, we really don't need a lot of information about where, where they're putting the barrels. I mean, that's really up to them if it's working to divert them, divert the bears from eating the trees. Uh, the only time we're, we're uh, asking them for any kind of information is when they're hunting in an area, and then that's, that's a whole different story. That We need to know if they're using bait, where the bait is, and, and, and those locations of those things. So as far as the feeding sites, it really doesn't matter where they're putting the supplementary feed as long as it's in relation with the, where they're trying to reduce the damage. I guess I can, I can understand um, what you're saying about the cost 
prohibitive nature of the state running a program like that. Um, I think, though, there are critics I've spoken with who would say, okay, fine, let WFPA handle the cost of it, but shouldn't the wildlife um, management, uh, you know, state wildlife management services basically, should there not be greater information sharing or oversight about exactly how this program rolls out every year? In other words, why don't you want to know where the feeders are? Why don't you want to know how much they're feeding? Why don't you want to know how many bears they're feeding? Why don't you want to know the ingredients every single year and test it yourself? Why not? Okay. And, I, and I can answer all of those questions for you. The, the, we manage bears on a population level. At this point, the only thing we're concerned with is the number of bears on the landscape, and the number of bears harvested. Those are the only major, the major two things that we need to know to manage bears on the landscape. And we can get that information without knowing how many feeders are there, how many bears are feeding, and all of the information you just basically uh, iterated. So we don't need to know any of that stuff to manage bears on the landscape. It, because we manage on a population level. We do need to know what bears are harvested. We do need to know the, that the methods being used to harvest are are in in alignment with the, with what we put out there in rules and regulations. So those are the things that we're interested in. We don't we're not an agency that's going to know everything about every bear on the landscape. That's not. There's no way any state wildlife agency can know what individual animals are doing. We manage on a <coughs> a larger uh, population level, and at this point, bears are doing fine in the state. Their populations are, are, are doing just fine, and there's really no need for us to be concerned uh, with, you know, individual woodlots and how, how many bears are in that individual woodlot or whatever. So that, that's why we don't, we don't need to manage on that small a scale. Do you have anything to add, Stephanie? No, I would just say, and, you know, it, the timber industry does issue an annual report that we have access to. And so if we did need those points of data and know that type of information, or we had concern in a particular area, we could certainly work with them What's on in those it? pieces. The, What's in the that report? report mm -hmm. It usually uh, mm -hmm. d dictates like uh, how many, how much feed they had put out and um, what season, they, what time frame they were using it, and uh, the, the differences in the, the change over time. They have like a, an annual report, so they look back past history was there a change in the amount of feed needed this year, and what was their economic uh, output for this year, and that sort of thing. Has the state studied how this program affects those r specific bear populations instead of looking at it from a statewide perspective? Um, because I, th I know this sort of goes into the depredation program a little bit, but have we done any research about uh, whether what you're saying, if that's what really matters, that's what the state cares about, is that the population, generally speaking, is sustained. Do we know, though, in these specific areas where this is happening, have we done any research about that? Sure. So we do have ongoing research that's looking at, uh, not specific to these areas, but specific to populations within that include some of these farms and, and that ha that some of these tree farms that have feeding. Uh, so we have one site here uh, uh, on the west side of the of the divide and one on the east side looking at population levels. So those do encompass some of those areas. So yeah, we are looking at population levels uh, at those in that, that encompass those areas. So yeah, I mean we look at those type of things and figure trying to figure out what bear densities are uh, in comparison. Okay. Um, there's nothing specific to feeding, though. Right, as I was just going to yeah. say, it's not. It's not directly related. This project isn't generated because right. of feeding. It's generated for us to manage and look at population. Population levels and of bears. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have anything specific to no. this feeding program. No, we That's do correct. not. Okay. Um, and that's an important thing to. to to point that we're, we're not studying anything related to how supplemental feeding affects bears. Some of that research has already been done, and I think 
we gave you a few of those papers. It wasn't done from the department. It was done on private and the federal agencies that were involved. So the, the yeah, USDA, USDA has, has done a lot of, of this work. work. Yeah, and that's that works for you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have a good working relationship with them. Right. And they're really the agency that deals with a lot of the wildlife damage issues. They're a federal agency. They deal with it in multiple states. So when it comes to wildlife damage and how to manage wildlife damage, that tends to be, uh, they tend to be the umbrella agency for that. Okay. Okay. Um, You recently acquired, or the last couple of years, you required oversight of this program, right? It was under enforcement. Um, you created a subcommittee to look at uh, closely what could be done better. What did you um, learn about areas for improvement that you wanted to focus on or that your staff is telling you you need to focus on? We let you okay. probably dealt sure. with that one. Yeah, sure. Um, well, several areas <coughs> we learned that we wanted to um, get a better understanding of who who was involved in the in the program itself. Um, because it was under different management, we didn't have necessarily all those contacts, and we had created a new position within our own organization. And so we needed the biggest thing we needed to do was build relationships and in, and bring those conflict specialists that are now under our wildlife program that will be helping with this this process in the field bring them to the timber industry owners and let them meet each other and get to know each other and learn the landscape that was the biggest thing that we we learned from that process the other piece was uh, there are varying um, varying uh, viewpoints both within the timber industry and within our own agency on how we might want to work together and, and manage this program or at least um, have it be effective, an effective tool. The other piece I want to add is that this is only one tool of many that we utilize for damage issues and so it was important for us to understand the value of that tool from our biologist's perspective as well as from the timber perspective. And there were a few uh, I guess what I would say more logistical things and in, in, in trying to set establish when we would be issuing this permits what did we see over time were the critical uh, time frames for these events to occur um, we also one of the key things was we needed to gather the data we wanted to make sure we were getting the data from the whole program and since we've taken it over we've had 100 percent reporting we've had complete compliance on providing us with the data we requested so what data is that uh, it's data we they have to the timber industry actually has to submit a, a photo and a request to uh, provide uh, to utilize any of the tools that we have available for them to mitigate damage on their property and um, we have to verify that and through the photographs and through field visits and interactions with those owners we're able to verify yes there is damage yes this is uh, you know a significant impact to them so we would want to be able to help them with their process and you're saying prior to that there wasn't a hundred percent compliance I don't know honestly I you can't didn't have the program. I can't report mm -hmm. ex exactly to that but what I do, do say? know oh, sorry go, go ahead. ahead but no. we did receive data we had data it mm -hmm. was coming in mm -hmm. Um, I you just don't know if it was verified. R right. In these particular cases, when you got information about damage, did you go out and find that the damage was there? So I didn't personally. We have field mm -hmm. staff. Um, we work with the timber owners either through conversations and, and site visits, through photographs, and those um, other entities like that, we are able to verify that there's damage. Okay. So you're saying 100% of the time people were telling the truth. They had damage. Somebody went out and looked at it and... I was saying that... Uh, 100% of the time we received what we needed from the timber owners for request for verification. We were able to say yes or no, there was an, an incident there with that warranted further action. And then when we did take further action, any data we requested from them in return was received and that was 100%. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Where were the rooms? I don't. I don't think we actually got on this though. Okay. Where? What did staff say they thought 
should be improved about the process? What were some, I know there may be a lot, but what, what do you feel like were the real hot button issues that um, when you brought everybody together and, and asked them their opinion on it, what were, what were the concerns? They wanted, um, so as an agency, we agreed that we needed to get a stronger hold on when these, when these activities were going to take place, and that's what I was referring to. You know, do we feel that there's damage actually occurring? We needed to confirm that or at least feel confident that there was damage that needed mitigation. The other piece was that uh, we needed to make sure that we had access to these areas. We needed to make sure that there was a uh, understanding of when these when these mitigation efforts could be deployed and and we wanted to improve um, conversations with our staff and those timber owners to make sure that the best or the most appropriate method might be deployed. Um, we we look at ourselves as a resource for not just the general public but these commercial entities and we want to help them to be able to have a successful business as well as maintain wildlife on their landscape. And one of the values of the timber industry is that they provide a lot of habitat for wildlife and not just bears but a variety of wildlife. So it was important for us to have that relationship and, and make sure that we're getting uh, compliance within this program to then facilitate uh, improved relationships for other issues that we might be dealing with with wildlife. And then a couple of the other things included um, we wanted to be certain that um, all, well, as always, and enforcement had this before, we require, if they are removing any bears, we require them to turn in uh, a variety of pieces of data, including um, parts of the animal that were harvested. And so we needed to make sure we were getting full compliance with that. And there was a belief that we hadn't been, but we have had, we have had success in that realm. I mean, we have 100% compliance in that. There's no doubt we are receiving what we are requesting for for bear, bear hides, parts, and all that yes. kind of stuff. Okay. Um, yes. <clears throat> how do you know? We issue a permit for a removal, and we require them to turn in either the, the hide, the skull, the gallbladders, and we then, we have a data system that we enter all this information in, we collect it all, and then we cross-reference it, and we check the box that it's been received and it has if it hasn't been received then we follow up we've only had one case where we had to follow up and then we got the material how do you know that somebody doesn't take an extra bear or two where we have enforcement that's their um, division but uh, we don't as biologists we don't go out and confirm that they're only on one single um, operation um, I guess we, we can't I don't know yeah, how you so want to, to address that. Really that basically, it's it, we don't. I mean, people are going to be if they're going to be bad actors, they're going to be bad actors. That's not that's not what this program is about. I mean, there's people hunting bears in the spring and in the fall, and I'm sure there are some that are taking bears without a license or without. So there's there's a lot of that that happens. Uh, to to administer the program, we're holding these folks to what we have agreed with them. If if we find out that they are doing things that are that are outside of that program, then obviously they would be prosecuted through whatever legal means we have. So that's I think that's outside and beyond what this program is. Well, Illegal things that happen yeah. are investigated uh, if we catch them. I mean, it's like any other crime that occurs. Y you know, if you you can only. Uh, prosecute someone if you catch them doing the crime and and we do have law enforcement uh, out there looking at these places and and checking but obviously we can't catch everyone that's uh, that may commit a crime uh, and that's related to wildlife and one other piece I would add um, on that side is that these um, participants are required to phone into our enforcement right. office to let them know that they're going to be out on the landscape and when that is they're going to be at out what time frames and window time you know periods right. they're going to be out. So our enforcement is aware they're partnered with us on right. all of this and they're aware of what activities are occurring on the landscape. And so that's one of our ways of trying to check some balances and discourage anyone that might choose to do something that's not ethical or you know not within the, the agreements of this program. 
so um, I'm going to have to push you on this one a little bit because uh, I have several documents of hunters. I'll give you one name, a guy named He's a prolific hunter with this program. And a couple years ago, um, he was uh, caught not using his tags correctly. Um, and I don't know what else there may be on him because I only got a couple things. But I specifically saw an officer saying he should have his rights revoked mm -hmm. to hunt in this program. And he's still getting permits, even up to last year. So right. why? I mean, those are those are legal issues that have to go through the legal system. It's, if he's legally able to hunt in in our system, he's legally able to be one of the hunters in in that. So I mean, we can't really we can't really say what goes on through the. So once we f uh, write someone up, they have to go through a legal process, and if that legal process still allows them to hunt, then they're legal hunters. They ha they can be still hunting. So it's not, we, we can't. So even if they're breaking the rules, but a court doesn't find them guilty, but cool. you know they're breaking we the rules I mean, of the Bear Timber Depredation Management Program, right. there's nothing you can do. Exactly. I mean, there's laws we have to follow as well. I mean, that's, that's a frustration in, for, for us on many fronts, not just in this program. There's lots of people out there breaking uh, uh, rules and laws pertaining to wildlife, and then when they do get a do go to court, sometimes they're found uh, innocent, and then basically they can go back out and buy a hunting license and do those things again. Uh, so there's that happens all the time in, in general, I guess, including in this program maybe. And I'm not familiar with the one you're, you're referring to because obviously, I mean, there's... I guess is it, on, is it the responsibility of the, the WFPA to have hunters who they feel like are above board on these issues? I mean, I, I, I would think so, but I would leave them to answer that question. Well, you leave the responsibility to them to manage this, essentially, when it comes to the supplemental feeding 100%. Correct. But with this, the permits go through George, right? They Doesn't do. George sign off on them? So George. Ziegeltrum, yeah. right? So George signs the permit. He, he knows that this guy I'm guessing. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't know. I Maybe know. I need to ask I George. Don't, I don't know. I, that's the thing. I don't know what they know and what they don't so know. This so this is my, so I guess this brings us back to the communication and the oversight and the management of the state with this program. I mean, if we were talking about five bears or six squirrels or something, I think it would be different. But is this, is this, if we're, if we are going to continue it as we have over the last 30 years, does it behoove the state at all to have more oversight on these particular concerns of, of a hunter who, listen, maybe he's not prosecuted because I, I'm going to go out, having read thousands of documents, the, the way the tags are and the hunters are frustrated with it and they don't, they're confused and whatever. Um, maybe the problem is the rules, that the rules aren't clear enough. Should there be clearer rules? Should there be better oversight? Yeah. How does a hunter like that make it back into the program year after year? when this is something you're trusting is being managed by another agency. If, if I can just, let's back up a little bit. Um, I just want to say that this program is uh, for all commercial timber. It's not just the one uh, industry and entity, WFPA. Mm -hmm. It also involves smaller timber owners. Mm -hmm. So it's a variety of, of folks who are, are utilizing this program. and. <clears throat> Through that process, we generally work with either the direct timber owner or the direct timber manager. In the case of WFPA, yes, we do work with their point person. Um, and as far as the hunters themselves, they're working directly with the forest manager or forest owner. And through the WFPA process, that isn't always their point person, it's the forest manager that is uh, delegating or assigning and, di and dictating who's hunting on their forest. So when we have issues that come up that cause us some concern about either what has happened on the landscape or the why were permits issued or any activity that brings an awareness to us, we share that with them. And in through our own process, if 
if our enforcement officers have found a violation, they will ticket them. We can't, beyond that, it's really up to the legal system, as Anissa described, whether or not they, their, their hunt, hunting rights are revoked. If their hunting rights aren't revoked, they're still eligible for the program. However, we do inform those uh, landowners that there have been some concerns and this is what has happened on our landscape. And, and ultimately, yes, they do make the decision. We, within the RCWs, do not have the, if they've gone through the legal process, we're limited by the laws as well. So we can't necessarily say, well, we don't like what you did, you're not in the program. Should but you have the right? Should you have the right? I mean, maybe the RCW doesn't <laughs> let you, but should it? Well, I don't know if, if that's a... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's really... It, it's, it wouldn't be an RCW. Our RCW says if somebody breaks the law, we ticket them and they have to go through the, the process. We're, we can't be the, both the, the judge, jury, and all of those right. things. Basically, uh, we, we have only limited authority when it comes to that. Uh, and I'm not going to answer sh should it be because it's really not something that we can even, you know. Uh, do you, I guess maybe a better way to phrase that question is, do you, f are you comfortable with the amount of control you have over the vetting process yes. of these hunters? We are. Uh, yes. no, not the vetting process of the hunters because we don't vet the hunters. Exactly. That's my yeah. question. Are we're, you comfortable we're, we're with We're comfortable that? with the program as it's run. Yeah, there's going to be bad actors, but there's bad actors in every program that we run. Any, anywhere you go in any program, in any agency, there's going to be public that are going to be bad actors. And then all we have to deal with that is the legal process. That's basically the, the, the tools we have to, to deal with those things. If we catch someone doing something wrong, we write them up, they go through their legal process. That's, that's the way it works for most things across. Do you think your staff this that, yeah, go ahead, sorry, sorry. This doesn't happen frequently. I mean, yeah, this is exactly. an infrequent occurrence. Right. And, and I, I know what incident you're talking about, and it, it's a very infrequent occurrence that we have anything like this occur. And so, yes, I think we are comfortable with the amount of with the response we've had and, and how we've been able to manage this program. How do you know it's infrequent or that you simply have staff that is only able to do so much when it comes to the oversight of the program? I mean, enforcement doesn't have enough people to go out and watch sure. these hunters sure. all no, the time. I mean, but that's the same as even just recreational harvest. I, you know, sure, but this is this is a sort of a special program that this. But the it state really, is but it really isn't. I mean, you keep saying it's a special program, but what's so special about it? Basically, we're we're giving these folks tools to use to try to re, to try to reduce their their timber yes. damage. I mean, it's not. There's actually many, many, many more bears harvested through normal licensed harvest than there is through this program. So, to me, it would behoove us to be basically put more. Uh, law enforcement out there during the general season than to be spending it on this program because it's really a small, a very small number of harvested bears with this program versus the, the general hunting that, that, that we have out there. Respectfully though, this hunt is special in that it happens on private land behind locked gates and there are feeder barrels out at the same time. And that brings me to sort of another criticism yeah. that I've gotten as I've talked to people, which is, do you think this is a baiting? Uh, I mean, it, it, is this baiting bears and killing them at the same time? Are right. you are you putting out bait barrels? Are these glorified bait no, barrels? No, so, so in, the, in the rule, they're not supposed to be having the feeders out when they're hunting. So so they shouldn't be out there. But so they can they have the feeders out for their active permit. They're just supposed to remove them when during. They hunt. Yeah. But how do you enforce that? If they're you allowed to have it at any time when they're act right. when their permit's You enforce active, it like you enforce anything else. Basically. Are you all going out and enforcing it? Well, we're we're doing again. We're checking uh, as our law enforcement is out there. They're looking around if they have a hunting. So that our permits are set, and they we need to know we know the dates that they're supposed to be hunting. So yeah, we go out there, and if obviously we can't visit every site everywhere, we, we're limited by manpower. But we do check in those time periods if they're hunting that the bait barrels are not out there. Now I'll have to say we do also allow hunting over bait during these. So there is a baiting component uh, as well. So so they may not be they can't use those bar those barrels with feed the feed 
that they use, but they can use different bait that we've identified to basically harvest bears in that area as well. So there is a baiting component as well. Yeah, so the only thing I was going to add is, you know, the intent of the supplemental feed is a diversionary so resource for a bear, so it doesn't peel a tree. And while we have this other component that's another tool for them to allow, for them to remove that animal, if they remove that feeder barrel, they're also removing one of their tools. So it, they're having to choose between two different tools that could help them. And so with their feeding, they're using that feeder barrel, the supplemental feed, and then all of a sudden they want to actually remove an animal, they're, they're having to remove a tool and run the risk of having increased damage by that supplemental feed being removed th to then have a harvest occur. So it, there's a trade-off there, and it's, I think people don't understand that. And it's important to understand the dynamics of what the feeder barrel, the supplemental feed is intended to do. It's really intended to minimize those bears from peeling. And when that supplemental feed is not there, the likelihood for them to peel may actually increase. Mm -hmm. And there have been a couple of research papers on that. Yeah. What about um, they take the barrel and they leave the feed? Yeah, I, we've, I, we've only had one incident where I, I know that has occurred and we asked them to clean it up and, and they did comply. Did they not know that the feed was not supposed to be on the ground? We, we really can't say. I mean, they, of course they knew it, but we, you, you know, you're asking us questions that you should be asking the folks that are, you're right. that are actually doing the, okay. the, the actual stuff. Let me, let I me mean, read. all we can do is when somebody does something, uh, you know, that's not within the guidelines we've set, we ask them to, to f fix it, and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll comply, and we'll check if they complied, and if they haven't, then we'll figure out a way to, to make them comply. Uh, other, why... So, but why they do it, or why they didn't do it, or why it could be there's we could you know okay. sit here and, and come up with a hundred different scenarios to why, but we really don't know. Fair point. So then, let me ask it a different way: If you know somebody's doing that, why do they get to still participate in the program? Because there are lots of reasons that that, that could have happened. So uh, you know, did you they ask, tell you what the reason was? Well, all we know is if if it's happened, we ask them to to fix it, and usually they do, so. What about asking them why that happened? Why they're leaving the feed out while they're hunting? And maybe we have, I just don't know what, if we have it or if they answered. I don't know how infrequent it happens. It's not something that, that's, you know, that's, that I'm gonna get all the information on every place that, that's out there. So, I mean, you're asking hypotheticals again, and I, I can't really answer a hypothetical. Well, they wouldn't be hypothetical if the state was pursuing that information. I don't know what information I guess you're asking us mm -hmm. to pursue. Well, somebody leaving feed out, why they did it. I guess for me, I'm wondering I mean, why not ask the question. So, the, so, What's the, so why we not ask, ask it? Yeah, and that's fine. That's a fair question. So we ask them, and they say we 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 tipped it over, and the, the feed fell out, or whatever. So they give us some excuse. How is that going to improve what we do? We just say clean it up, and they clean it up. And so it's easier to get to the end point than to ask a bunch of questions that they could come up with a bunch of answers for that that really don't get to the end point to what we're trying to accomplish. So. Yeah, we could ask those why questions, and we probably have, but their answer isn't going to be, isn't going to make it change things a whole lot, I guess, except for they just gave us an excuse why, that, why that they. And you asked why would they be able to participate in the program, and the answer is that they complied with us requesting them to clean it up, and the program is something we've constructed. Again, those are parameters that we developed as a procedure for this, this program. They're not held to any legal binding agreement that they have to make sure that they clean up the, the feed. They, they do sign the, the permit that says they're going to comply with our conditions, but, right. but we have no course to go back and say, we're going to you know, remove you from the program for five years. What we do is we give them the option to fix it. If they don't fix it, that's a different story. But they fix it, then in our program we say, okay, if you've corrected the mistake, then let's let's move forward and continue. Now, if you continue to correct the mistake, that to me is a different 
course. That's not an accidental, that's not I didn't know, that is an intentional, or at least perceived as an intentional, it could be perceived as an intentional, and that raises us to a different level. Do you think it's the, st since I think we, we all know who we're talking about here, um, do you think it's the state's uh, responsibility with that particular person, um, if he, for you know, a year before, had added something to his barrels that really is not breaking the rules because, like you said, there's no rule. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another, um, you know, oh, well, the, sorry, the feed dumping was yeah. So, but let's talk about for a second because I want to go back to him. Okay. Um, so you have this guy who's a timber um, services uh, insider, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, does all kinds of things. Um, and he is adding stuff to, um, according to these documents, is adding stuff in there. There's no rule. Should there should there be a rule? Is that, is that problematic? And then can we go back to and say, okay, you have a guy who, um, you know, I remember as I was reading through the subcommittee report saying, okay, the reason that we don't get the coordinates on the barrels is because we want to reduce poaching. But you have a guy like him who is setting out the barrels and he's doing the hunting. Like, what's up with that? So can we talk about both of those cases? Do either one of those con concern either one of you guys? Or is that, again, just sort of a uh, sparse reality, a couple bad apples, or not even just guys who just sort of made a mistake? Yeah, so <laughs> those are two different things. But um, with the first case, uh, we have worked extensively, and I think you probably have seen that with the particular landowner you're talking about, timber owner you're talking about. And, you know, honestly, I actually did a site visit to his property so that I could help better inform him about bear biology, bear ecology, the reason to use diversionary. He, he is not part of the larger timber industries program, mm -hmm. and he's a small timber owner. Mm -hmm. And I, honestly, I just don't believe he had information because after we visited with him, a lot of his practice had changed. He changed, made a significant change in what he was doing and how he was doing it. So I think a lot of it was misinformation that was either provided to him or maybe his own assumptions. And we've worked with him to correct many of those. Now, I don't know what we'll see this year, but I anticipate it's gonna be much different than last year. Okay. The other in entity is, um, it, it is, that's not something new, that the, the timber industry might hire the same folks to set up those feeder barrels as well as to um, do any other damage mitigation efforts, which may include removal. That's not unusual. That's fairly common practice. And honestly, I don't see that as a conflict of interest because of one thing. Then they know where the damage is occurring they know where things are happening, and they can keep an eye on the pulse of that activity. If it's increasing and we're not seeing <coughs> an effectiveness of the diversionary supplemental feeding, then I, if I were a timber owner, I would want my person to know that and be able to tell me so that I can then decide if I should be doing a different mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. So that's not uncommon, and I mean, it's even true for other cases. I mean, we might have people out there on elk fields doing hazing and maybe ultimately removing, but they're monitoring it for them and they're trying to do that diversionary or, or uh, uh, deterrent measure and then it may end up to go to a, a removal, an actual lethal removal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to the coordinates on the barrels just so you have the chance to respond to that. Um, the safety concerns, what, what, are, what are you looking into when that is uh, brought up and, and besides the safety, what are the other issues and how are you addressing that? So there are concerns about <laughs> our staff safety, obviously working working around those areas, and then also, um, so we're working with the timber industry to ensure that there is some consideration given, so that we know where those locations are, and we can ha and ensure that our staff will be safety, but are safe. But some of the concerns we have are about uh, you know having those locations available and people going out and participating in illegal activity because they all of a sudden know where these supplemental barrels are, and of course where there's a supplemental barrel, hopefully there is a bear feeding instead of on a tree. So we're concerned about in, you know, illegal take and um, in addition to our staff safety. So what is the plan moving forward on that? So, you know, 
we're working with the small timber owners in particular, but we're working with both timber owners. The small timber owners are a little easier to work with only because they have a smaller landscape. They're, the, lands, the lands that they have are much more manageable. Um, there's fewer uh, opportunities for them to use supplemental feeding, that sort of thing. But um, we're having our conflict staff work directly with the forest manager and informing them I'm going out on this site, you know, do you have any barrels in this area? Should I be aware? What, you know, what coordinates or what area should I be, you know, most worried about or concerned that I might in, in bump into a bear or, you know, encounter an animal? So, yeah. and then maybe I'd like to add to that. Yeah, to please do. So, uh, this program is is not a done deal, I guess. And, and that's well, of course not. You were so, working so on your subcommittee, so right? Not just yeah. that. We're working with them, and they're working with us, and we're trying to improve things on both sides of things, including, you know, where the barrels are and all of those things. So these are things we want to improve on. But 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 uh, I think you 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 often think that we have kind of. Uh, this authority that we don't to do a lot of the things that, that you think should be done that we don't. So the way we do approach it is we're working with these folks uh, to improve the program moving forward. And every year we might find out things that, that were, may have worked and some things that may have not have worked and we'll improve on them. So it's still a very young program. Not, it's not been going on for 35 years. Yeah, no, in our, in our, in our. Okay. In our program, it hasn't been with wildlife for only three years, uh, maybe four now. So we're trying to improve upon it. Yeah, the program has been around for 30 years, and bears have been peeling trees for probably thousands of years. Well, no, because so there were tree farms that, you know, had herbicides killing their natural <laughs> food source a thousand no, years ago. No, but no, no, maybe no, so, but not no, to the extent were, that they, they are were now. peeling them yeah. because at that time of year, there's very little natural food. And, and so it's, it's just, that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, yeah, there's other mitigating factors, but uh, just to get back to the point. So yeah, this, this program will improve over time. We certainly want to improve things. Uh, obviously not everything is perfect. So, you know, uh, pointing out all the, the, the things that, you know, how are you going to deal with this? How are you going to deal with that? We, we don't have all the answers for you now because these are processes we're working through. We're, we're still meeting with folks, uh, both internally and externally, to try to improve the process, both for, well, mostly for the bears and for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the timber owners as well. So uh, it's an ongoing process that, that uh, we don't have a, a lot of the, question, the answers to the questions you're asking because we're working through those processes right now. So Do you feel like the answers that you have been given uh, and keep in mind, I won't because I, you said mm -hmm. you think I I think you should do this or you should that. Right. Frankly, I'm coming in here saying I'm I'm I know what other people are saying that I've mm -hmm. interviewed and right. I know what the documents are saying. So I'm you, I'm a vehicle for that voice right. so that you right. can respond to it. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you these questions because right. I have a personal vested interest no, no, in what right, you yeah. do with the bear That's program. Right. Yeah. Um, but I it, I don't think it would be fair to not give you the opportunity sure. to respond to the criticism. So that's where that's yeah, coming from. Yeah. Um, do you feel like, though, with the the warnings or the nudgings, however strong they may be from your staff about the the questions you say you haven't had answers yet, I think there are some who would say they have given you answers and they're concerned that management's not listening to them. Do you feel like you're listening to your staff? Yeah, I, yes. I, I do feel like we listen to our staff. Staff are people too, and they're going to have their opinions about how things are going. So some of them are going to be good opinions, some of them are going to be bad opinions. So uh, just to say, because you've heard from some staff that, you know, management is not listening, uh, isn't always an accurate picture of how things are going. So people are going to have uh, perspectives on things. So yeah, we're doing, uh, as managers, you know, and I'll take, I'll take it as being the manager, we're working through a process to try to improve things from the perspective of our employees and from the perspective of the of the land managers it's not as simple as just saying yeah we're going to do this and th and then therefore it is so it's it's a it's a process that's trying to make everybody whole uh you know uh in a way that's that's best for the bears and f for the for the land managers that are trying to make money growing trees 
providing a lot of wildlife habitat as well uh, in addition to that. So. And do they have, I know in, in other um, depredation programs you uh, talk about or at least in some way share data on economic loss. Mm -hmm. Do they have to tell you their economic loss year to year? They don't because they don't, they don't harvest year to year. So that, that's, the, that's the, the really difficult part when you're talking timber damage versus mm -hmm. other types of damage. So are the other but types do they have to quantify like the trees at the various peel? Do they have to quantify no, what that don't. damage would they be? they don't. And the reason they don't is because we're not paying for damage. We're just okay. trying to mitigate it. Uh, the, the, the programs where you end up uh, wanting that information, you're paying for the actual damage like a crop or whatever. These, this type of situation doesn't lend itself to that, nor could we pay damage on a multi-million dollar, uh, you know, or farm that, that may lose, I don't know, whatever percentage of that. So even if they do still sell the wood, mm -hmm. the timber from that, um, it, it, they, sh they should still be eligible. So in, in other words, if there's really only a minimal economic loss, they, sh there's, they should still be eligible to participate in the depredation program because there is some kind of yeah. um, damage. There's some, there is some kind, okay. Yeah, so the bit that we base it on whether they have damage or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't. We can't really know the extent of the damage because these farms are, you know, they're not harvesting for 40, 50 years, and and the damage occurs at a young age of the tree when it's 15 to 20, you know, f well, 12 to 22 years old. Uh, so you don't know. It's a cumulative damage. You don't know what the total damage is. So the best approach when you don't know is to mitigate it when you can and try to reduce it as much as possible. And that's the approach we've taken. Why do you get a permit based on historical damage and not fresh damage? Well, we, you do have to have fresh damage. You uh, can have it from the year before, right. no? Right. Okay, and, why? And the rationale for that is, like I said, I mean, these trees are vulnerable from the time they're 12 years old to the time they're 25 years old. So if you had damage the year before, you can almost guarantee you're going to have damage the year after because that not only are those trees already been peeled and they could be peeled further, uh, but there's other trees right next to them that are the same age. I mean, in reality, we, should, we could give permits to folks that have trees within that, that, age, that age class because it's... Without even yeah, damage, right. Right. just give because, it to them. Yeah, because I mean, basically you're trying to avoid the damage. Once the damage has occurred, you're almost too late. If you want, you want to be ahead of the damage, not, uh, you know, kill the animal or, or, or b feed supplementally after, it really does no good. That tree's already damaged at that point. So are you saying that's a better way to do it, is to kill the bear before there's damage? Not, t not certainly kill the bear, but try to, yeah, figure out a mitigating way. It might be some of the other tools, but uh, certainly killing the bear is one of the tools. But, but yeah, if, if, you know, you, if you know that that's going to happen year after year, reducing the number of bears that could peel in an area would, would be a way to, to get ahead of it. So in this case, it sounds like then it's a, it's a numbers issue for you, not a problem bear issue, because I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. how you know you're getting the right bear. Yeah, you don't. You don't. I mean, there's been some research done about what maybe what type of bear does it and the, and the, and the data shows you know oftentimes it's it's female bears and all these other things but you you hardly and males do it as well so it's not it's not that clear I, you don't really know but if you have fewer bears in, in a wood lot you're they're le you know, you're less likely to see the the peeling happen do you get fewer bears when you put out a barrel of feed no but you but that's a that's a different way of dealing with it you're diver divert diverging them from eating the, the, you have other food sources for them in that area. So that's a, so, so that's the thing. I mean, either you're, you're giving something else to eat or you're removing bears. I mean, those are the two kind of conflicting tools that you have. One is a feed that keeps bears from peeling, but if that's not working, then you have to go to whatever other tools you have. Well, and I might add that the human presence on the landscape, whether they're successful at right. or harvesting or not, the human presence has an impact as well. Right. I mean, just having more bodies out there, having more activity going on, 
it will disrupt a little bit of that behavior and, and it may actually have yeah. a, and now we haven't measured that, but other studies have looked at things like that and you know, human presence in general is a deterrent for, right. for most wild animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, I had another, <laughs> I'm gonna switch us real fast to this. Um, in the 90s, uh, voters outlawed hound hunting and this is really, as far as I've been able to find out, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the only places that, in times of the year, that you can hunt bears with hounds, mm -hmm. right? Is that right? Is it the only? You know, I wouldn't classify it as hunting. It's, it's, it's a harvest, it's a removal that may result in harvest. It's a damage event right. that is authorized. We have the authority through our director to authorize activities that would then mitigate damage, and this right. is one of those. Right. So you don't classify this as hunting? No. No. Okay. Um, do you think the program then is transparent in that regard with the public after this vote in the 90s? Do you think those two are, mute, are okay together. They ex they exist in in fine plain view together. There's no no sort of concern that the the state in one uh, instance is going against voter desire. No, because I mean the law is clearly states that we can use those tools for for these certain things for you know dealing with with management issues, uh, dealing with public safety and all of those things. So it, it's it's you know, we've kind of gone through those rounds and, and have figured out that these are uh, measures that we can use in these situations. And they, we use it for cougar as well when there's uh, depredation issues on livestock. We use hounds to, to do similar things to remove that cat or whatever. So. Why use hounds for these hunts? They're an effective tool. Yeah. I mean, They're very effective. Yeah, I mean, basically hounds, <laughs> I mean, it's it's unfortunate that 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 tool was removed by that uh, legislation because it is really one of the, uh, the ways that th the most effective ways to to pursue and uh, harvest bears and cougars for that matter. So I mean, if you could have fewer people doing it and and remove just as just as many bears as as you needed to. So. So you think, in some ways, the vote in the '90s made things worse? Yeah, I, I do think so. I think it removed that tool from the toolbox uh, in general. You could have people taking care of their own things. Now we have to go through a, a very rigorous process to, to permit people to do it. Okay. Why get two bears per permit? Why do you get to kill two bears per permit? I guess, you know, that just gives them a little bit more flexibility, you know, oftentimes if there's more than one bear on the landscape, it's still having to go through that whole process again to get another permit. It gives them that flexibility of taking two bears. It's just something we've come to when we're, when we're dealing with it on a day in and day out basis. Uh, oftentimes, if, if there's, you know, more than one bear, by the time you issue another permit and all of that, the more damages occur. It's more of an efficiency thing, I guess, to, to to try to uh, provide, I guess, customer service to, to get to the issue quicker. So again, it brings us back to this being a numbers Correct. game, not a problem solution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, there's a problem solution. Oh, yeah. you're, you're solving the problem with the numbers. Well, yeah, but you would so. say you have a bear that's, n that's not peeling trees and you just kill the bear, you kill that bear. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like it's a spe it's a very targeted problem yeah, solution. No. It sounds like it's more like if we kill enough bears, then we'll just reduce the problem yeah. by virtue of a numbers Correct. deal, not not by I, I that's that's the bear I want. Yeah, I'm there's, there's, you're, yeah you're never going to know what bears are peeling and what bears are not. So that's that's kind of out out as a as a solution. It's, you can't you know. Unless you catch that bear actually peeling, it's, you're never going to know. So I mean, the, the t yeah, the tool is coarse, but it it, it does reduce the the, the damage. So um, WFPA and a couple other people have said that the um, the problem, and you kind of mentioned this in Nice before, but that one of the main issues is um, mother bears with cubs, um, and 
what's the policy if a hunter has okay so you have a permit for two bears and you find you come up on a, a sow with two cups what do you do well it's written in the permit that we recommend that they uh, do not harvest females with cubs or harvest cubs with it knowingly so it's already we've we've already discussed that with hunters we've already discussed that with the timber industry we discourage that action okay andy do you need sorry mm, no You're good? Yes, we're we're right. wrapping. We're almost done. I just want to make sure I got through everything. Um, I do. I would like to go back to. Yeah. I think it's really important, Allison, for folks to understand that this this program has been going on for thirty years, as you stated. Um, but we are at a point where, when it came into wildlife, we found there was value in, in knowing this this information and having these these data points, and we are refining it. And while you might have mixed messages from the folks you speak with. Um, there have been significant improvements over the last few years, and we're moving forward. And I'll bet you if, if I'm still around, you come back in 30 years to interview us, we're probably going to be looking at a, a very, not a very different picture, but a very solid program that will have 30 years of data just to support what we've just done. And, and there'll be some additional changes over time. And I think it's important for people to recognize that. And what, what, when we brought that committee together, that was made up of people who have been involved in this from the very start, back 30 years ago. People who just came into the agency. So we had a variety, and that was what the value of that group was. We had a variety of perspectives. And some people were still um, under the wrong impression. They had information that may have been a historical point in time, but has already changed since then. And that was brought into all of those discussions that you have the notes on from our committee. So while it might say, oh, well, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that, or I don't like this and I don't like that, some of those things have already changed. And, and even though they're in our report, that report was meant to fully inform the diversity of perspectives to our senior management, to let them know we have staff, we have out, you know, stakeholders who think this way. We have staff and stakeholders who think that way. We have staff who don't even have don't even have a clear understanding of our own data at this point. That was the reason we brought everybody together like that, so that we could get all those perspectives and then move forward with, you know, what I would consider an improved process. Okay. All right, let me just look at these real fast and make sure. Yeah, why, I don't think, I, we touched on this, but I don't think I got a clear answer on it. Why does George approve the permits? Why does George Ziegeltrum approve those? That's their uh, business operation there. That's how they've established it. I think it has to do with the fact that he runs the their animal damage committee. And so he actually manages their supplemental feeding program. He manages anything that has to do with wildlife or animal damage to their industry. And that was their, that's their business practice, that it should go through him. And quite frankly, it makes it very easy for us to work with just one entity rather than 50 different or 100 different timber owners on a one-on-one. -on -one. But if the state typically in other um, Areas when you're giving somebody a permit to kill an animal, you're you're doing that. Not in all cases. No, no. no. Okay. What are an, what's so another? There are case? depredation uh, kill permits that we give to landowners on on crop depredation that they can give to, to other people as well. So on the okay. on the crop depredation where there's a middleman. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So you're approving the in that case, just like this, you're approving the damage, right. not necessarily the hunter. Right. Okay. Exactly. George is approving the hunter. Right. Okay. Or he's choosing. I mean, choosing. He's not approving. That person has to be, uh, you know, somebody who can legally hunt a bear. So yeah. But yeah, he's choosing from whatever pool of hunters he may have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I did want to ask. I heard that Blakely stopped supplemental feeding. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I I couldn't comment on that. There are various reasons why some timber companies come in and come out of the program, um, yeah. and I. George would be the better response for that one. I are you aware that they did? I'm aware that there are a couple of uh, programs that are re coming out of the supplemental feeding, and I know I'm aware of a few others that are adding into the program. Okay, but so no comment necessarily on why I, they're doing I don't that. know, and honestly, okay. that's not. We don't 
try to get involved in their management of that. That's really their program. Um, our program is the, the damage permitting and verification and working with the timber owner on other mitigation efforts. Um, I know one of the things I read in the uh, subcommittee report was about silviculture mm -hmm. and working with the timber farms to yeah. have um, different practices that would help reduce the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does that include? What, what are you hoping the timber farms could do to, to practice silviculture in a way that reduces their conflict with bears? It's yeah, I mean, neither of us are silviculturists, so it's kind of hard for us to answer that question. There are certain things you can do uh, to reduce some of it, but n not all of them are, are uh, always effective, so it's kind of a hit or miss type of thing, uh, like uh, pruning, uh, you know, different ways you, different stocking rate of stems per acre, that, those type of things, but I can't really speak to it. I'm not a I'm not a silviculturist okay. by well, any means. And so. it varies. It's going to vary on the size of the yeah. the, t the timber land, and as well as you know if the manager is is interested in working on some different tools and techniques. And we have a few small timber owners who have expressed interest in looking at some different ways to approach stuff. Right. And so we'll be working our conflict personnel and our research people will will be working with them on some different ideas. I mean, our, our wheelhouse is the bear management, and that's what we concentrate on to make sure mm -hmm. that... Are you talking about the permits, the depredation yeah, permits? Okay, yeah, but those are, I mean, it seems like they're a little bit married in that, I mean, you know, you are f feeding in order to not have to use these permits, right, exactly. and they're happening right. concurrently. But so. I mean, we're just making sure that, that, that the harvest that happens isn't... Uh, isn't affecting the overall bear population. That's our, that's our main concern in this issue. And and while at the same time we're able to reduce mm -hmm. the, the timber damage. What about regionally speaking when it comes to the harvest? Mm -hmm. Do we have data on whether in these pockets the depredation hunts, what, what do you want me to call them, Stephanie, if they're no, not that's, hunts? That's, I mean, that's what, what we're looking are, right? at. Is, well, they're, they're you're starting to look into that? Removals, damage yeah. removals. Damage removals. Okay, so mm -hmm. when, you're, when you are looking at, do we know how, say, if there's sure. 20 or 30 percent or what the numbers are, um, how that affects their dynamics? and? Sure, I mean, that's yeah. that's exactly what we look at, and that's the data that, we, that Stephanie was talking about that mm -hmm. we're getting. and. And comparing it with with regular harvest and and so we are doing structure, that. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. that's yeah. that's our wheelhouse. That's okay. the data. When did we, we start doing that? We've always we've always had limited data. Now we have better data since right. we've taken the program on, okay. making yes. sure we're getting the scientific data off of these bears, ages, all of the stuff that helps us that helps us know what the population level effect is going to be on the bear. Okay. So you know. One of the biggest things is is a percentage of females being harvested. I mean, that tells you, you know, you don't want too high a percentage of females right. being harvested because then your population will start declining. So those are the things we look at, and, and so far it hasn't. No red flags have gone up. It's not yeah. dissimilar from our uh, general season harvest. Or I mean, we we collect sex and age data on the bears that are removed through the damage removal process. We compare that with our general population harvest, uh, regulation harvest, yeah. and we look at the trends in those. And if, if we don't see any red flags, we're in a comfort zone. If we see something that's a little uneasy, then we would want to address that. As far as looking at the permits requested for um, these harvests, they really are kind of all over the place. I mean, some year you'll have more, some less. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a, not something that someone should look at to see if there's a success to the program? You know, should you not necessarily be killing less year to year? Um, how do you, you know, how do you sort of explain that to someone who might say, um, is supplemental feeding really working if one year you kill yeah. 80 bears and the next year you kill 120? Well, there are a variety of parameters that affect yeah. that. It's environmental conditions. Or right. th that's a huge factor in, in what we see happening on the landscape. You know, you'll, you'll see one year where you won't have the request for permits right away, and that's because there is a huge spring vegetation 
you know, component out there, and we had a, a light winter. So bears come out, and they're, they're not damaging as much. But then you might see another year where it was much harder, and, and we see significant damage. So that, that's just one other component. You know, these things, they're multifaceted. There's so many pieces that come into this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, environmental factors play probably more into it than, than whether they're feeding it or not. And then you have the age progression of those stands as stands, well. Yeah. So you'll see us you'll see a change over time on that factor as well. So there are several factors that, that come into play why there may be more permits one year versus the other year. You just mentioned the the um, timber companies entering and exiting their the supplemental feeding program. That plays a factor. You know, those all of those components combined will create the picture for whether or not we're gonna have more more permits one year and less permits another year, or could lead to that anyway. Right. And when it comes to supplemental feeding for how it affects, um, not specifically related to working to deter the bears from the trees, but how it affects bears, generally speaking, do they have more or less cubs? Are they bigger or smaller? Do they have a greater life expenses? You know, all those things. Do we know anything about that? Not a ton. Yes. There was, I think one of the papers I gave you looked at home ranges, and home ranges don't seem to change whether you're feeding or not. A lot of times, home range is related with food resources. So at least in that study, it didn't show that much difference. I don't think there's been a whole lot done on, you know, the production, cup production or, or you know, health and general uh, ecology of the bear. I don't think a lot of that work has been done. There's been some nutritional yeah. work done, but it's, you know, it's not, um, there's been some, at least, I can say, and, and, it's, it's and not. The reason probably is, is it's such a short period. So bears that time of year are just basically hanging on until real food comes onto the landscape. When real food comes onto the landscape, then they're gorging themselves. So they, they're very plastic animals. They can, they, they're, you know, they can wait around a little bit until there's good food out there, and that's when they're filling up. So it's just a, a short critical period that we're trying to get them through with this feeding. Uh, it's not a, it's not, I guess, they're probably going to gain some fat, but it's not, in, in comparison with the rest of the year where they have natural foods out there, it's probably a very small piece. And, and honestly, the fall, the fall resources are really important right. for production. Yeah. But we, when you and I talked on the phone that one time, I was asking about when they are breeding, and they're breeding right when you're feeding them. Right? No, no they're, breeding, they're breeding. I thought you said they were later. breeding the spring. They breed in June, usually. L late May, early June. Okay, well, that is that when the supplemental no. feeders are. George just told me it's May and June. So mm. the supplemental feeds are you know, mid April, but usually May, June. The breeding occurs June, July. Yeah. So, I mean, usually it's after that. It's when, when things are good on the landscape, when there's yeah. good food out there. Mm -hmm. And the breeding, like I said, it, because of the biology of the bears, they don't have to be in prime condition to, to breed. breed yeah. They have to be in prime condition to give birth. And there's a difference there. And that's why there's delayed implantation and all the things that, that we talked about on our phone call. So they breed. If things are good, then they implant. And if things are really good, you know, most okay. of the cubs will survive. So it's... Mm -hmm. it's and that's a, it's why the fall, yeah, the fall, the fall resource resources are really resource critical for I bears. See. Right. Okay. So yeah. that's, that's why it's that, that critical time period in early spring, it's basically they're just hanging on till, till the real food is, right. is out on the landscape. Because, uh, you know, there's way more resources out there on the landscape in general uh, than these little pockets of, of feeders that, that, that these folks are putting up to divert them from eating. So, I mean, that's kind of what the bears are waiting for is when berries and mass crops start showing okay. up. What's the cost to the state, um, generally speaking, year to year to, you know, whatever anything that's associated with this, whether it's writing the permits or forcing, any idea? What what it costs the state every year to deal with uh, this? Not really. I mean, I mean, it, a lot of it is is stuff we're doing anyway. I mean, it's just we that's we have biologists already out there doing a lot of this stuff. We have conflict specialists dealing with one thing or another. Writing so the permits. Right. Yeah. I mean, th that's 
Yeah, yeah, that's a, a couple salaries. A very small. No, not really, because they're dealing with other things okay. other times of the year. Uh -huh. So the bare component of it is just plugged it's into just that. So what about the subcommittee that you put together? Was there a cost associated with that? Yeah, certainly, well, there was time. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, How yeah. much time? So I, I don't well, know how we many met, times did they meet? Yeah, we met quite frequently, and there's travel expenses for that. Um, I think that was in the report. If I remember, we we submitted a little piece in, in the that? report. Okay. And I don't do I don't work. recall. Yeah, I don't. Know. I mean, but it, there but was a cost, but yeah. that's not That's not any different yeah. than what we do with any other program. I mean, if yeah, we, sure. we yeah. look at what we're doing with wolves. Yeah. You know, no, I know. That's what I know. So. That's way out there. I know. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just curious because yeah, I, I don't. That. I couldn't give you an exact number, but certainly okay. by hosting that subcommittee and trying to pull all those ideas together. Yes, there was a cost, but right. there's also a value to it. Sure. We we ended up with what I think is an imp an improved process, a, a more streamlined process, uh, you know, and and better data collection. From 2015 to 2016, what what were the major changes? Did we, I mean, did anything change in the way you? Yes. The rules. What rules changed? So we um, tightened up the boundary for the pursuit. From? From five mile to a three mile mm -hmm. boundary. And that was based on some of the data we had collected. Um, we did allow retention for at least one harvested animal. We also expanded the ability to use bait for the master, the, uh, the hunters mm -hmm. that would be boot hunters. Okay, so you can retain one carcass. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, because I remember reading like all the arguments. If you're, so if you're not doing so, yeah. anybody that goes out on these can who has the permit a boot hunter a boot may, hunter may retain right. one full okay. carcass, the not a hound hunter. hunter. No. The houndsmen okay. are still required to turn in all galls, hides, and skulls. Why is that? Why different for them versus the boot hunter? There are more people involved in those hunting parties, mm -hmm. and just. It's just been a standard practice. It still allows us some accountability for that practice. Mm -hmm. And it may change through time. I mean, like I said, we're, we're still kind of working our way through some, a lot of these processes and what makes sense and what doesn't. And so, I mean, it's a, it's, an er it's a process that hopefully will get better with time, and that's, that's what we, we want. I, I do know the hunters, uh, and I don't want to say the hunters, like it's a monolithic group, mm -hmm. but, you know, some of them feel like the process has been confusing for them, um, that they don't, you know, maybe they don't necessarily want to be a poacher, but um, the way it's all, you know, getting it to lane and, and down in Centralia Fernhide and you know, what tags you put on what thing and mm -hmm. um, not getting them from the state in a timely fashion, but the foresters tell them to get out and go kill the bears. Is there validity to those concerns from the hunters? Yeah. At some, some level, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're working through to improve those processes as well. I yeah. mean, everything we do has to balance, you know, how much, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the value of it versus, you know, the, the making sure every, everything is done right and have the right permits and all of the things. So uh, we're just trying to make sure that, you know, it's it's good for everybody, and bears included. So. Yeah, it's an important tool for managing these damage issues, and so we're cautious and, and really conscientious about, we have various stakeholders involved. We have the hunters, we have the timber owners, we have the general public who want to see bears on the landscape. We have our own agency staff, and so we're trying to manage a program that is going to fit all of those in, while maintaining a decent, healthy resource on the landscape, and uh, all of that, you know, those those questions you're getting or concerns you're getting, all of those things are still on the table. We're still working through all of those pieces yeah. and trying to improve as we go. Uh, you know, honestly, we, re we send out the permits via electronic mail now, and it never used to be that way. So now they get the permit. Yes, they're not getting the tag, but it used to be that they didn't even get the permit that way. So slow process, you know, right. you chip away at things and you finally get them to shape you're looking for. And so that's where we'll get there. Okay. The Depredation kills are not included in the statewide harvest numbers for bears, are they? Or at least not, they're not the ones that I can access when I'm online looking at. Right. That's correct. Yeah, that is Why correct. is that? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Because in the past, we weren't getting those. I mean, it's only been a year or two since those were coming in 
uh, I guess, all 100% of them coming in. So we wanted it to add them, you know, would have been, uh, I guess now we can. We have the information that's good enough. We could probably add that information. We do it, you know. And, it, and we try to put on our website just the, the sport harvest. So the management stuff we don't all always put on our website. Even the cougar management stuff we don't put on our website. So, so do you yeah. include it though when so you're talking about your managing the wildlife yes. population? You, so, you include so it's it for your included own state. in our status right. and trend report. Uh -huh. right. It's it's stated clearly in the status and trend yeah. report. So we account for it at that level. Our regional staff, the district staff, they account for it in when their reports and they're assessing populations in their areas. Right. So it's definitely accounted for. I think you're you're referring to it being captured in our in our harvest. wild harvest data, yeah. and and that's a completely different system that we're we're actually capturing the data through two different systems, but we do blend them into the status right. and trends report. You know, one of the pieces I think that's um, remember we never four years ago we weren't necessarily receiving this data through the wildlife yeah. program. It was coming into enforcement, so we were getting it from enforcement, and then when we took the program over. Now we've integrated a new data set, right. a new database that allows us to capture it within that database and then share it. And Nice, when you were saying you only have been getting it 100% the last few years, what does that mean? What, what, what weren't you getting well, this before? Well, just good, good information that tells you, you know, ages of the animals and all of Why that Why are you stuff. getting good information now and you weren't getting it before? Because there's a little bit more oversight. I mean, we're, we're, you know, following up and things like that. So. Can you be more detailed about that? I'm just not really. I mean, we're just we're just making sure the information is coming in the way we want it. So it wasn't coming in before that. It's hard to say whether it was yeah, coming well in we or not. We don't know. That's the thing. I'm but just trying to understand what yeah. the process, what has changed about the process that you you know you're getting more than you were before. What what did you change about your process? Well, we created a, a central data system right. for that, and we have staff that are dedicated to addressing these issues specifically. I mean, before when enforcement had it, it was one person managing the whole program. And so now we have different levels of checks and balances. Did you turn in your report? Did you turn in your tag? Did I receive the, the parts that I should have received? So we have several steps through the process where we can say, we don't, we don't see this here yet. Let's follow up with them. Okay, it's here. And in most cases, it's very little follow-up, to be honest with you. So yeah. the past data is probably as accurate as it as this current data, but we can't say for we sure. We can't say. That's, I guess that's what I meant when I said we didn't know how it was collected before. We know how it's collected now. Okay. So we have more, I guess, uh, confidence in it. I think my only other question, um, unless you guys have something else you want to add, is there are those um, who there are those who would criticize this program as a fraternity of hunters mm -hmm. who get to run their dogs still mm -hmm. after the outlawed hound hunting in the 90s. Um, one said to me that the attitude among most foresters is uh, the only good bear is a dead bear. That it there's one on one end and one on the other, two bears per permit. What happens in between is a, is is um, really not information that anyone's interested in. What do you think about that criticism or that attitude? I mean, is that unfair towards this program, or is there a valid concern there? I think it's a generalization, to be honest with you. People say what they want to say and what they believe, but I can tell you from what we've seen through the data collection, it's not we get one bear on one end and we get one at the other end. It's There's no clear pattern like that. It's I think it's just speculation, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, people are going to have their opinions, I guess, but I think the program is running as probably as best as it ever has. I think we are at a point where we're really seeing what is going on in the landscape and being able to assist producer or timber owners and assist and make sure we are maintaining the data so we have what we need to ensure there's a healthy bear population out there. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I really, I don't know that I have a ton to add. 
base I don't you I don't, don't have to if you don't yeah no I, I don't th I think I mean as criticisms go it's a criticism but is it is it valid you know it's it's certainly somebody's opinion and that's that's that vali yeah. validates it exactly. right there that that's the way they feel uh, do we have concerns I mean we we certainly have concerns but we're trying to address those concerns uh, are we overly concerned? No, we're not overly concerned. We, we're just working through a program. I think using hounds as a tool, you know, supplemental feeding as a tool, all these things that we're using are tools to try to get to a point where, uh, you know, people can grow and harvest trees and we can have bears on the landscape all at the same time. And that's our objective is both of those things have to occur. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, Obviously, we're going to be more on the bear side of things because that's our charge is to protect the bears and make sure bears are, you know, perpetuated uh, into the future. And that's that's what we concentrate on. And I think I think we are doing that. I mean, that's that's our main objective. Is it what is the percent? Any idea of the ones killed in the the depredation? Uh, so it just it just depends on <laughs> what data set you look at. Whether it's the you know, so that it's a big data set. Uh, if you're looking statewide, it's a small percentage. If you're looking, like what? Uh, so it's so less than ten percent. Uh, so it's a hundred bears yeah. roughly killed uh, through this program per year. About yeah, there's right. roughly thirteen to fifteen hundred that are killed statewide. So minimal. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Statewide. Right. So and then in your little pockets, say, how do you even look at that? Yeah, I mean, you can look. You can look at them. Yeah, you can look them by GMUs, and and it, it it's a little bit higher percentage, obviously, when you look at it at the, in that sense. You know, it's it could be, you know, up to, and I, I don't I don't have the the data right there in front of me. It could be up to twenty percent, right. but uh, of the total harvest. Uh, but that doesn't concern you. No, because no, I mean we are counting that as harvest. I mean it's not like it's it's above and beyond. That, so we're taking that information. We're looking at ages of females and all of that stuff. We, the percentages and all of that. Uh, it, yeah, it doesn't concern us. I think we we under harvest bears probably in the state as a whole. So it's it's not uh, on a population level effect. It's not a concern at all. Uh, it is a concern that things are being done properly, and that's kind of what we concentrate on is making sure that those folks are held to the standards that we set yeah. set forward, and we do our best to make them live up to those standards. I do have one last question that I thought of. You know, as I remember a couple years ago, um, doing a story about this guy in Renton who uh, left his trash out, um, and, and a bear, a mama bear with two cubs, got in it, and then. Um, then he decided, after it bit his dog's butt, that he was going to just put dog food out anyway, baited his son was waiting in the boat, and he popped it, right, and then left the two babies. Um, I learned through that that if you are warned by an officer to um, put your garbage away, that um, and you don't, that you could go to jail, and you can be fine. A serious yes. offense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's considered baiting, even, in that, mm -hmm. in that case. So I'm curious. Is there any concern about supplemental feeding, training bears to eat out of big barrels? Sure. You know, it just, I guess for, for me, and maybe this is just somebody who's not in the middle of, of that management practice, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Yeah. So, I mean, they, there really isn't a difference. The, the food is, is geared towards, you know, meeting their certain needs for that time of year and it's it's usually but they're going to eat it. It, it it's totally different than what trash is obviously yes. so the food source is different if 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 uh, i guess bears aren't really trained to you know eat out of barrel or not eat out of barrel they follow their nose to anything edible and they're going to eat it whether it's in a barrel or whether it's anywhere so if you remove that attractant they're not going to be there so it, it to me it doesn't train bears they just they're walking on the landscape, come across food, they eat it. That's basically the way the bear looks at the world. So why is it okay to do it 
at Weyerhaeuser, but it's not okay to do it in Issaquah. The These reason? are forested environments yeah. versus inhabited And you're using it for a reason. You're using it to divert the bear from eating the trees. I mean, that's the main take home. It's not, you're not baiting bears to ha because they love them there and they want them on their landscape. They're feeding them because they want them not to eat the, the cambium from the trees. And I might add that these things are not necessarily just scattered across the landscape, you know. Right. They're in clustered areas where there is this, this damage occurring. Right. So That's it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an apples <laughs> and oranges type of thing. I mean, right. uh, yeah, bringing a bear into a neighborhood is different than, you know, having a bear in the woods where basically it is. So they're not taking them out of their, their environment. They're just giving them a food resource there that they can use to get through that, that short period of, of spring in early early summer. Do you think the public should be supportive of this program? I, I, I do, yeah, I mean, that's basically we're, we're trying to find a way where uh, folks can still grow timber and harvest it and bears can still be on the landscape. That's what we're trying to accomplish with this program and if uh, uh, unless you're opposed to timber or you're opposed to <laughs> having bears on the landscape, you should support that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an either or. We're trying to make sure both are able to be there. So. Okay. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that you two f really feel passionate about that you want mm -hmm. to be out there? Well, one thing I do want to say <laughs> is, you know, I, I, we, we hear the criticism and we take it to heart and we are working to improve things. So that's, that's our mission, I guess, is to just keep working with this program until it's basically, you know, hopefully free of controversy. But I don't know that it'll ever get there, but that's, that's our hope. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we want to see out of the program where we're we've got healthy bear populations and people are able to grow and harvest trees and, and not, you know, have to worry about uh, their livelihood, so. Yeah, and just we continue to make improvements, and yeah. you know I recognize a lot of people have been familiar with this program for years, yeah. but it's really it's got a new focus on it. We've brought it into the wildlife program. We have a need for this data, and so right. through that process itself, we're we're making significant improvements to to what we're seeing as a as a tool that we can use to mitigate damage yeah. and, and we're not averse to criticism nor are no. we deaf to it no. that's what helps us improve the processes right. so those people that that you've talked to that are critics uh, you know please continue to be critics because that's how we improve our process so that's why we had the diversified group yeah the committee brought together so i don't want them to think that you know you know where we ever stop improving things. I think we always want to keep looking at ways to improve them, so. Um, I don't know if you even know the answer to this question, <laughs> so if you don't, just, but I, sure. it just popped into my head that it's probably something I should just ask you about. I, I, there was an email chain um, about um, <laughs> an unlawful guiding, that's what it says on there, like unlawful mm -hmm. guiding, I'm looking into them, I need any information on this guy. But I really like some of these things come back and they're so, you know, disorganized. Like I don't know what I'm getting, and so are you aware of anything? So you like asked that? why we limit the houndsman to one, uh -huh. because it's um, to one limited. to one carcass retention. I thought you, they didn't get any. I mean, to not the houndsman. Not the houndsman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we limit the the hunters to one mm -hmm. carcass retention. That's so that they are out. They harvest the animal. They remove the animal. We're it's done. We don't allow the retention for carcass parts. You know, we do allow them to keep, the houndsman can keep one carcass and that's it, just the meat carcass, the meat of it. The meat, but they the can't hide. keep the hide or the gall or any of the skull. And that's because of the potential for hunt, houndsmen doing guiding hunts. And so the, one of our houndsmen who spoke to us said, he would feel very more, he'd feel comfortable if we said no to these things because he doesn't want to see unlawful guiding. And so that's one of the reasons why we said, okay, that makes sense. We don't want to have guiding on this. This is not a recreational harvest. This is a damage mitigation tool. We can do that. So we did that and we stuck with it and we're going to stick with it. There's value in that. It limits that. 
potential for maybe some ethical, unethical mm -hmm. or abuse. Do you anyth know anything about that specific case? No. Okay. Um, okay, and you feel like people wouldn't use it for unlawful guiding if the, they can't keep the, the animal? What's the value in it? You're Running your dogs? Yeah, but there's no... The hounds team, the hounds men themselves, have to be permitted. It's their dogs. They mm -hmm. have to verify that they're their dogs. Mm -hmm. And so to bring other people out and then they don't gain anything. What do they get from it? What's the, what's the reward? Well, it sounds like they like to take their dogs out and chase animals. But they have to but be they're permitted. Already, they're already per we're permitting them to do that. So there's a, the guiding part of it is it, I guess, is what we're trying to. Oh, address. Okay, okay, okay. The houseman himself. Well, could is it permitted. still be a guide though? I mean, what's the, what are? Well, I guess maybe I'm missing the, the the definition here. What would you consider a, a guided? So a guided hunt is where a houndsman takes a person out mm -hmm. and they shoot the bear. Okay. Or a, hunt, a boot hunter and takes a person out but right. they can, they but shoot the bear. But that's what this can, you can still do that, right? I mean, no, you just can't keep it. Right. But I could still, could, you could still could. take it. I guess potentially, yes. But I mean, it, it just reduces the likelihood of somebody wanting to shoot a bear just to shoot it. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It's, most hunters are not motivated that way. I'm sure there's a few that are, but. It's a lot of effort. Yeah. I mean, this is not like you just take your dog down the street and, you know, go to the yeah. nearest neighbors. It's a lot of effort. I mean, hound hunting involves a lot of training with your animals, and it's a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. So for a hunter to want to just go out there just to be on a hunt, it's very, it's very rare unless they're getting something in return. But there's no other option for them to be a hound hunter for bears at this point in the state. Well, they're but not the a hound hunter. If they're they don't not own the hounds, they're not a hound hunter, I guess right. is, is what we're saying. Okay. These so are just people who, okay, right. I see what so you're saying. These are people who are coming without right. dogs. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they would just be hanging out with people yeah, with dogs. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's exactly. where the guy part comes in. And if you want to pay to okay. run around with a guy. Got it. So that's why mm -hmm. one of the houndsmen said to us, you know, if you allow, a, allow that opportunity, you might encourage people to do things that they we wouldn't want them to do as ethical right. houndsmen. Exactly. So limit that and we weren't inclined to do go that direction anyway, so yeah, we were fine with that and appreciated his input. Um Anise, you said when we were talking about the numbers and you said we probably under harvest bears mm -hmm. in the state. Right. Um and I and and reading through some stuff from way back when, I remember reading about the effect of the hound hunting mm -hmm. ban and you know what did that mean and right. um, so do you, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I I have heard from people that there's not there's not necessarily um, as much oversight put into the program as you would with wolves for instance because those are an endangered species and we have a lot of bears mm -hmm. does that does that the fact that we have bears in the state and they're not endangered, um, make them less of a priority for management um, oversight, that we would put more effort into uh, data sharing or managing it, um, more sort of, you know, be more detailed yeah. or more sort of hawkish about it if no. there were less bears? No, we wouldn't. It doesn't make them less of a priority. It does give us parameters that we can work within, though. It does give us wider parameters we can right. work within. So yeah, I mean, we, we monitor uh, bear harvest within our game management plan that we have to be within those parameters. And as long as we're within those parameters, we have, so you, so basically, if you have a population of 25,000, one or two additional bears harvested are going to be less of an effect on the population than if you had 10 wolves. One or two wolves to 10 wolves is a big number. So yeah, it gives you more, uh, I guess, comfort that you're not over harvesting, uh, but it doesn't make them any less of a, of a priority. We, all right. of the wildlife we manage have similar value to us. Uh, and we manage them accordingly. We have guidelines that we manage them by and, and we, we stick to those guidelines. So we're not more hawkish on one versus another. We just manage them differently. But, but we stick to the th to things we manage them to. 
I promise this is my last one. Right. <laughs> stacking, bear stacking around the feeders. One eating it and the others peeling the trees. Um, that's an, an just the final thing that I thought mm -hmm. of that I wanted to make sure that you guys had the opportunity to address. Does that is that a problem from what you've seen? Um, is there a concern that the feeders are bringing in extra bears that don't mm -hmm. necessarily get a chance to eat at the buffet table and they're instead peeling trees? Yeah. I, I guess I don't really have enough information to say. Uh, I don't know that there's been a study done on that to, to say for sure. Could it happen? Yeah, it could. But it, I mean, most of the studies show that when you put a feeder out, you reduce peeling. So uh, based on that information, I would say that that's not as likely. Uh, there's a lot of social behaviors that happens around feed sites with bears that actually it probably prohibits that from happening. Uh, so I guess I don't know, I, I don't know the answer, whether it's a yes or a no. Like most things in science, it's probably a maybe. So okay. it, it could possibly happen, but the, the research shows that the feeders actually reduce peeling. So if it does happen, it's, it's right. probably a, a smaller number than the, otherwise. The, 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 yeah, than, than otherwise, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's been some research done on, as Anise alluded to, the social dynamics of what occurs mm -hmm. at a feeder site. And so while you might see multiple bears there, they do have their hierarchy that right. they, they kind of stage out. And so it may be that that bear that's waiting in the wings, as you're, you were alluding to, they wait and then the other bear leaves and then they come right. in at a later time to feed yeah. at that feeder. The, the bottom line is what Anise said is that it showed to reduce the peeling and that was the intent of that. Right. Oh. It's, it's, a, it's a lot easier for a bear to wait until the bear that's dominating the feeder leaves than it is to peel, because peeling is, is time intensive and they're, so if they know there's a ready source of food, they're more likely going to wait and, and wait their turn, I guess. Really? Yeah. They wait their turn? Yeah, I mean, if, you've, if you know, I'm those of us that have worked around bears, you know, have seen the dynamics that happen. A big bear on, on a carcass or whatever, you know, it, they're usually the only bear there, a big male bear. There n there's not going to be a, a female or cubs coming near that because that male is going to kill the cubs to mate with the female. So, so it's usually their carcass and then when they leave, I mean, they can only eat and gorge for so long and then they have to go lay down somewhere and then the other bears come in and, and so there's been some evidence yeah. for at least a shift in the pattern. Yeah. Like maybe this bear used to come through at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, but now yeah. there's a dominant individual there, so now he's coming through at 3 o'clock in right. the afternoon. And there's multiple feeders, so... Yeah. I mean, and they have a very good nose. If they know there's a big bear on one feeder, they're going to go find the next feeder that's available. Sure. Bears just can't be, a, a big bear can't be everywhere at the same time. So they're not going to exclude other bears from all feeders. It's just, the, the density is not that high. So, I mean, there's just only so many bears in a wood lot. But you guys don't know exactly where the barrels are. So how do you know that that's not, you know what I mean? How do you know that it's not? Well, we, we know they're putting enough barrels out there to keep bears from peeling. <laughs> So that, it, I mean, th it makes sense for them to, to do it in a way that's reducing peeling. Which, yeah. I mean, it, it, so they, they're doing it for the reason to, to reduce peeling. In that, uh, so they're not doing it for any other reason, I guess is what I'm saying. Why would they put barrels out to, to promote bears to peel? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, me you tell me. me. It, yeah, it <laughs> makes no sense, and that's why it wouldn't concern us. I mean, yeah. They wouldn't the go through all that yeah, expense and that trouble. It's, a, it's not a, it's not it a were, cheap way to do it. If it were increasing peel, it's not, so it has some effect. They're a business. They're trying to be cost effective. I know when you were saying, like, you were going to, you're working on the whole, like, barrel location stuff, but mm -hmm. why not just demand that they give you the information? Why, why can't you just force them to give you the barrel information? What's... What's the challenge there? So it's their program. The feeding program, is, the, the supplemental feeding program is not our program. I it's, it's their program. And yeah. so it's their proprietary rights to that. There are other concerns, though. I mean, if they provide us those locations, then, you know, they are susceptible to public disclosure. 
and through that public disclosure process there may be opportunities for folks to then go out to these sites, remove bears that we wouldn't want to have removed at these locations. There are concerns about, you know, they have concerns about who's on their property and w when are they on their property. And so people are trespassing because they know there's a bear alert. And they want, or they want to go see a bear. I want to yeah. go see a bear. So yeah, so they go and trespass on the property. I mean, there's, there's a variety of reasons why and you know it's easier for us to kind of just work one-on-one -on -one with each of the foresters right. and our conflict staff building that relationship so that they know where those feeders the feeders don't you know necessarily stay the whole season either they're sometimes they are moved out of an area because they've not seen the damage occurring and and so the next year it's somewhere else and the, and the location of the beaver is only of a value to us for first you know maybe Public safety or, season yeah. safety reasons and if we're going into an area we'll call them and say hey where are the where are the feeders that we should be worried about and they would tell us so it's not uh, that we don't need to know where every feeder is on the place it, that information is really not of a value to us we it's, it's not changing how we manage things so just for us to have that information really isn't. The value of it is, hey, you submitted a permit for damage in this area. Do you have a feeder in that area? And we ask that up front. And yeah. if they say yes, then we know our staff needs to contact them to say, where is this feeder? Because I'm going to go inspect this area to make sure, you know, to, to verify the damage. Yeah. And so then that's where that comes in. Well, and then obviously, like you were saying, if they're going to hunt there, you want that thing removed. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean and so, and so that was, those are changes that may, that came out of that, you were asking about changes that came out of the, yeah. the advice, or the group, right. that was what came out of that committee, things like that. We need to know where they are as we're going on the landscape. Uh -huh. And as we run into things that, you know, just don't seem like they're working, we, we're going to hopefully mm -hmm. continue to improve the, the process. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the head scratcher for people when it comes to the supplemental feeding portion itself is that, like you said, Stephanie, um, it's you know you're saying you're you're saying that it's their program is the reasoning for the state not having data. Some would say it should be the state's program. I understand the cost prohibitive, you know, it being cost prohibitive for the state, but I don't think there are people who would agree that the reasoning of it's just the timber program I mean they get they can just feed thousands of bears because it's their program and they don't have to hand over any information to us because it's their program shouldn't it be shouldn't there be a better relationship between the state and the timber so, yeah and it, and it, so, so it's I mean, not just their program where they get to do whatever they want it's a private land issue they're they're growing these trees on private land and the bears are living on that private land and and if they're able in some way to keep them from peeling the trees that isn't detrimental to the bear. Uh, I mean, I don't see where, why do we need to be the person doing that uh, if they've taken it upon themselves to do it. Uh, there's a lot of similar things that happen in agriculture, you know. F on that scale? Yeah, I'm probably even on a larger scale. What animal? Uh, ungulates in general. I feeding? Mean, yeah. Okay. Where there's no, supplemental not feeding, feeding. Not supplemental. Well, that's what I'm talking about. There isn't a way to supplemental feed uh, ungulates to keep them from eating other things. There is a way to supplemental feed bears. I thought that's them. what you do in Natchez. No, that's that's a whole different thing, and we can talk about it more. But it's a, it's not it's it's not keeping them from eating agriculture. It's not keeping them from it's keeping them from dying. Well, it's, it's different. That's not what they say when you go over there. No. They tell you that they're doing it because they would otherwise eat the orchards. And, th and there may be some of that going on, you know. It's a, in that area, maybe, the orchards are, are a big deal. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just uh, usually if you want to maintain a big population of ungulates, and there are, I guess, I, I guess I didn't realize where exactly what you were talking about as far as most places that where we feed ungulates is to basically in winter when when there's limited food resources. If there are orchards nearby, obviously they'll go and browse on those. But uh, you're saying because of farmland, there's no right, natural food exactly, source for them anymore, yeah. and you're right. feeding them to keep yeah, them alive. Okay. Exactly. Well, it's not because okay. of farmland. That's part of it, but it's it could be a it. hard it's winter. It's because of a lot of things. Yeah. You know, there's a variety of things. And you want them around so people can harvest them later, basically. 
Yeah, you're maintaining a, a, a population base yeah. that has plenty of summer range. So there's yeah. plenty of summer yeah. habitat. Yeah. They're just limited on winter range. It's not, that's almost the inverse of bears. I guess still, if you, you don't see that feeding any wild animal on this scale, um, you don't, I mean, you don't think that that should be something the state says we know a little bit we have we have more of our you know more oversight over that it should just be able to be the the timber farms program. I mean they're feeding a yeah. lot of wild animals. Yeah. And uh, without without a whole lot of required, I should say, without a whole lot of required sharing of information. Yeah, and but I rules. mean, so so what's the no, like you said? There's no rule no, about I what agree. they even put I in agree. the feed. I agree, but what what's the benefit to the public if we did that? There is no benefit. So basically, we're going to hire more people to have more oversight. And then we're not going to gain more bears. We're not going to gain more anything. So it's basically a, a, a an oversight program just for the oversight. It doesn't gain us anything. We're getting everything we want out of it right now without having to be that heavy-handed. Okay. So that's yeah, that's what I'm getting at. It's like, why do we need to have the oversight if there isn't a population level effect on bears? If uh, they're still able to grow their, you know, their trees, and uh, it, so there isn't, uh, I guess there's, there has to be a need for oversight. If there isn't a need for oversight, then you're just wasting money. Okay. Cool, Andy. I hope you don't have any questions. I have no. Questions. Okay, <laughs> I think we're done.